but as I say, it's a function of the supply side, and we have to to look at that and look at all ways of of financing uh, home purchasers. The REITs issue, the REITs ha has been successful as far as I'm concerned. It has increased supply because not only did they buy lots of apartments and refurbish them to give better quality and are professionalizing and, uh, you know, being the rental market is being more prof professionalized with them. But many of the apartment blocks have the capacity to build beside the existing block. And already they have plans to actually construct about 6,000 apartments, sorry, 600 apartments uh, in the immediate future. Uh, but we, we, they're subject to the same controls as everybody else. They're subject to the same rent controls as everybody else. Uh, so uh, it's something we keep under review all the time. Uh, there are three of them on the market now. So they're not overwhelming the market or anything. But they're a new model, a new way of doing things, and uh, they're, they're, they're helping the supply. Uh, the bot at the bottom of the market, that's quite true, uh, but the same buildings were available to everybody else. Uh, you know, that's the way when, you go, when the thing goes bust, the first run of stuff is sold cheaply. But then a lot of people won't, uh, won't buy. Uh, Warren Buffett came in and he invested in Bank of Ireland here, and he made a lot of money. And he invested in Greek banks and he lost his shirt. And he thought both were a good idea at the time. And, and you know, that's the way when it's at the bottom of the market, uh, that's what happens. And we get all sorts of arguments that, oh, the property was given away and why didn't you wait and so on. Uh, you know, unless somebody sells cheap and unless somebody buys cheap, there's no market. And it's from then on that the market builds. And there's quite a viable market now for commercial property in Dublin. Uh, but it's on the back of these initial sales which recreated the market. Uh, the land banks, uh, you know, the same constraints, constraints apply to kind of use it or lose it tax system as apply to uh, the vacant sites levy. And I would like to have a use it or lose it tax on the land banks. Now, the big builders who have come in from abroad, uh, their intention is to build. I mean, Cairn are actively developing sites already, and they don't seem to be hoarding. Uh, I've met them to see what they were at, and they're in the business to make money from construction. They're not in the business, they say, to make money from capital gains by sitting on land banks. Now, the other big one who bought Cherrywood, uh, they're the same. 4,600 4, units uh, when, when it's built out, with a commercial centre, and again, they're actively pursuing the development of, of Cherrywood. Now, there are others who are sitting on land banks, and there are people who bought land at extravagant prices, and they're hoping if they're sitting it, uh, at least they'll recover their money, and if they wait another bit, they'll have capital gains. So, we're looking at the kind of lose it or use it or lose it model for, for land banks, but I haven't a solution yet. And again, Chairman, you might help us on that issue if you can come up with, uh, you know, you're right, there are too few landowners controlling land in Dublin. And if everyone holds back from the market, uh, first of all, there isn't a supply coming through. And secondly, uh, if uh, the site element of the construction cost is too high, to driving the price beyond the affordability level. So again, it's, a, it's an area that, that certainly needs, 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 needs looking at. Uh, the supporting local authorities and how we incentivize local authorities. Yeah, I'd like to support local authorities, but there are local authority elected members. And the local authority elected members have a function in this and a responsibility in this as well. Now, when I brought in the property tax, I gave a 15% discretion, plus or minus, up or down, to the local authorities. And most local authorities, for reasons uh, that were never fully explained, decided when they were skint for money to take avail of the 15% reduction. And in one of the Dublin local authorities, not only did they reduce uh, the property tax rate by 15%, but it was off the housing budget they took it uh, when they made the reduction. 
So I just want to make the point, without making it too strongly, that local authority members have a responsibility as well. And there's no point in cutting your own budget, uh, especially off the housing budget, and then coming back crying to central government and saying, give us more money. And it would uh, make you a bit cynical about giving more powers to local authorities when, when that was what happened. Now, other local authorities were cash rich, and they cut by 15%, some of them by small amounts, 3, 4, 5%. That's fine. That's the discretion which was given. But when there was a clear and obvious need uh, to cut the housing budget, was uh, less than admirable, I'd say, and I won't put it any stronger than that. Uh, so in general terms, yes, I'd favour supporting local authorities more. I favour more autonomy for local authorities. But unless uh, the local authority members are prepared to take the responsibility and use it uh, in the best interests of their citizens, then uh, delegation to local authorities won't work. In Europe, uh, we're always looking for more discretion from Europe, and we've got a lot of discussion from them. The latest piece was uh, they signalled it before Christmas, but they delivered just after the election, where they are now say that uh, because Ireland has made significant progress, that we can consider that we have balanced the budget even if we're within half a percent of balance. And a half a percent of balance is about a billion and a half. So, like, they have provided us with that leeway, and it's one of the reasons why I'm signalling that we'll be reviewing the capital programme uh, in 2018, because by that change in the rules, we've got extra flexibility, and as you take it out uh, over, you know, the last number of years when we get to that balance point, uh, it's quite a lot of money, and it's quite a lot of money uh, for spending purposes, and my preference would be to spend it on investment, in other words, on, on increasing the capital programme, uh, rather than uh, current expenditure measures. So that's one example of uh, flexibility from Europe, and we're working on other models. Now, it's true to say that other countries, especially the bigger ones, take French leave, not the kind of word, and uh, break the, the fiscal rules. But when you're smaller, you have to obey the rules uh, as best you can. But as well as that, we've gained by it, uh, by, by being prudent on the fiscal and economic rules. We're the fastest growing economy in Europe. Last year, we grew by 7.8%. This year, every agency, including the Department of Finance, has marked us up. We're gone to 4.9. The Central Bank is 5.1. ESRI is 5. The European Commission is around the 5. So we're, we're having a very strong year again this year. And next year, you know, the sustainable rate of growth in the Irish economy for the foreseeable time frame out for five, five years or six years or ten years is about three and a quarter. And we're above that significantly this year, and we'll be above it again next year. What's your figure for next year, John? 3.9%. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So we're just on, on the four. So, you know, by, there's a big advantage in staying within the rules, but they are giving us some flexibility as well. And I'd be advising through finance to, if I'm back there, uh, to use the fiscal rules cautiously and carefully so that we, we can keep growing uh, the Irish economy well above average and then using the fruits of that growth uh, to give us the, the leeway on expenditure that you're advocating. Thank you. One point, Minister. Um, just you, you, Minister, you can tell us about uh, how wonderful the economy has grown, um, but in, during the election campaign, uh, I, uh, I knocked on about 20,000 doors in Wexford, and uh, I seen a level of deprivation that I'd never thought I'd seen in my lifetime. And, uh, sadly, th the, those figures about, for the economy uh, don't necessarily translate into a decent standard of living for a lot of people. And uh, the fiscal rules that you referred to uh, can be very curtailing, and uh, it, it, they do have an impact on the living standards of a lot of ordinary people that isn't always uh, in the positive direction. Uh, what would you say to that? I'd say, first of all, that you're right. 
And secondly, I'd say to you that I never promised that the government could fix what went wrong in five years because the country literally was on the verge of falling over a cliff. And if you look at Greece, who got into trouble seven years ago, they're still in dreadful trouble. And there, there, there is no sign of a correction in Greece at the moment because they're following a different economic model. Uh, what I'm saying in this period of government, we must change the emphasis. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the fruits of the very strong growth have gone to reduce the deficit and to reduce debt. As soon as we balance the budget, that monkey is off our backs. And uh, what I'm saying now is, regardless of who's in government for this phase, and it's going to be you know, a different government in its formation, whoever was in there, there's extra money for social programs. And the next thing we have to do is to address exactly what you identified. And I mean, what we did in the five years was we kept basic rates of social welfare at the same amount. So what, 187 euros a week? Now, there was no inflation. We were lucky in that respect, very low inflation. So the purchasing power of the social welfare payments remained nearly the same. But of course, other bills went up. But what we have to do now is progressively give tax breaks to the people at work, increase social spending programs so that we have better health and education, better law and order on the streets, and we have to address in a targeted way uh, people who are in poverty and who, with their own best efforts, won't come out of it. And they have to get direct assistance. And that's the way that it will go, in my view, for the next the next however long this government lasts, and indeed the government after. But I think it's possible to correct the ills of the country in a substantial way over a 10-year cycle. But uh, what I would ask deputies to do is to look at what has happened for five years as phase one, uh, to create the engine and the vehicle again that can produce the resources. Now that we have the resources, uh, let's direct them towards the areas of need without uh, taking risks with the growing economy. And, you know, we can talk at length on other occasions about how you fill out the details of that model. Uh, but I don't disagree with your analysis. It's the same in my own city. And the deputy beside you will confirm that. Thank you, Minister. Final question. Sorry. Uh, the final questions are from Deputy Coppinger. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I don't have time to ask probably all the questions I'd like to ask um, of the Minister, but all of the questions are related to the Minister and to your department. Um, they, they relate to the EU and the capital spending for housing, the issue of vulture funds and REITs, NAMA, and also then finally to the RCTs and the tax evasion that's going on in the building industry, which would fall under the Department of Finance as well. Um, just to begin, I was a bit disappointed with your presentation, Minister. Um, you began by saying verbally that we need fresh thinking, but your opening comments never mentioned the word housing crisis, certainly not housing emergency. I think the furthest you go is housing shortage. I just don't hear anything today to suggest that you see this as being the emergency that it is. But certainly those of us representing constituencies where this is the number one issue in Dublin West and in many other constituencies where we have a homeless uh, and housing emergency. Um, you, you said, unless addressed, it could pose a serious threat to the competitive, competitiveness of the economy, was your first point, which I think is a little bit crass, just worrying about the competitiveness of the economy. It's the human cost that most of us are concerned about. But you are right, the, the rocketing rents are going to drive people. They're driving people out of the country already. Um, just the, the first point about the um, capital spending and the EU fiscal rules. Just to say, this committee was set up by the, the, the Dáil to come up with you know, key solutions to the housing crisis. It was a bit, again, bemused to see in the Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil deal yesterday. Um, the first point in, in, in the deal in the economy is an agreement that um, they'll maintain the commitment to meeting full the domestic and EU fiscal rules as enshrined in law. Um, these rules are preventing governments 
from borrowing at the current rates of well under 1%, even for things like long-term capital investment and housing. As other people have already mentioned, this has been a burning issue to resolve in the housing crisis. So it seems Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil are effectively promising to starve the country of funds that could be used for public investment in their opening um, deal. It's a slight document, but that is said. Um, and also, it, the document mentions it will significantly increase and expedite the delivery of social housing units, remove barriers to private housing supply, and initiate an affordable housing scheme. There's no mention of construction of building social, or building social housing anywhere in the document. Delivery of social housing units has come to mean, in the last government, HAPs, RAS, doing up voids. You know, it doesn't mean building actual social housing. So I'm a bit concerned that this committee is being a little bit preempted by uh, that document. Um, oh, what I would say is that Deputy, if, if ju we, just, in a, just in a bit of be helpful and clarify, irrespective of that document, this committee will have its own findings and recommendations, so we're not limited by any document. And well, I that's, hope not. Yeah. And that's, that's the point of the, the various considerations, that we will... We will Thank you, Chairman, we take the findings into account in the formation of policy. Yeah. Thank you. Take them into account. Right, right. Um, yeah, but I, th I suppose the key point, and a lot of TDs have raised this, is if we stick with the type of capital investment in housing that we've had for the last number of years, we're not going to solve the housing crisis. It's just not possible. Um, for, for example, our current social housing construction costs of, say, 180,000 per unit, it would only mean 13,000 units will be built if we keep and maintain the capital spend on housing. That's over five years. 13,000 units. It wouldn't solve anywhere near what would be needed. Um, just the, the second question will be on uh, vulture funds, which um, it's been well documented that, that the Minister and the officials that are here today have met with these vulture funds on a number of occasions. Um, they now control 5.4% of all mortgages. Um, but they actually control more of the rental sector because a lot of them were buy-to-lets with families living in them. And the likes of residents in, in Tyrrellstown in my own constituency are finding out at great cost uh, that they're now controlled by EPF, which is a, a vulture fund in, involving Goldman Sachs. Um, but, Minister, many of these mortgages were bought from state agencies under your watch. So the IBRC sold 15,000. Um, to Mars Capital, a vulture fund. Uh, the state-owned P permanent TSB and Bank of Ireland have also sold, uh, or, or AIB rather, have also sold mortgages to vulture funds, as have privately owned foreign banks like Ulster Bank, Danske Bank and Bank of Ireland. So it's been government policy to allow this to happen, um, to sell families' homes from under their feet to vulture funds. And... Um, you met with representatives of these funds on eight times in 2013 and 2014, and your department met with them 65 times. I mean, what were you talking to them about? Because um, you don't seem to see this as a problem, but these funds are going to quickly now sell a lot of these properties, and as residents in, in Tyrrellstown and in other places will find out, 90% of NAMA sales have been sold to vulture funds. So you could have shouted stop at any time, Minister, and you chose not to. Um, in fact, a lot of people have concluded the red carpet was rolled out by this government and by the department to these vulture funds. You say they operate under no different rules, but they're getting tax breaks as well. They're exempted from tax on rent rental income and from capital gains tax. <coughs> So that is a different rule. Um, similarly with the REITs, I'm a bit surprised to say they've been a success and they professionalised the market. Um, people who are studying them, like Dr Michael Byrne from UCD, for example, um, has done a report on them and argues that they help to push up the prices uh, across the board by reducing the amount of land available for social and affordable housing. And rents have gone up by 10 to 15% in the first half of last year. <coughs> where these REITs now control a huge section of the market. Um, similarly with NAMA, Minister, um, 
you, you say NAMA has a commercial brief, but you can change that brief at any time. And surely when you saw the you know, housing crisis unfolding, that it was time for a change of, of policy. Um, NAMA, in its uh, end of year review in 2015, generated 32 billion, but it only spent 260 million on social housing, a tiny, tiny fraction of what it could have spent. Um, it now has, and, and I would ask you why you don't intervene with this minister, and if you are going to continue to be the Minister for Finance, which obviously we don't know yet who will be, but why don't you intervene to tell NAMA that the three billion cash in hand that it has at its disposal <coughs> at the end of last year, which could build 16,000 social housing units straight away, uh, could, can you not direct them to use that rather than spending on the docklands, on commercial property? Um, would you not recognise that there's a, a social housing emergency? Uh, the other question, just in relation to NAMA, is where are these NAMA starter homes that you're talking about, Minister? You mentioned them again today. And I've asked you before, now I just looked up during the meeting. There's two NAMA housing estates in Dublin 15, where, where I represent. So Diswoldstown Manor. The Eagle is its name for the three bed properties. They're 395,000. They've gone up actually in the last few months. I think they were 365,000 when I checked last. Um, in Hamilton Park, the other NAM estate in Carpenter's Town, the minimum three bed is 410,000. What starter homes are you talking about? They're not starter homes that they're building, they're, they're selling houses for commercial profit. And they'll build them wherever they think they'll get the most money. Again, unless you intervene, unless the government intervenes, that's what they'll do. And 10% is all that will come the way of our local authority, which is struggling with a housing emergency. Um, just lastly, uh, Minister, on the RCTs, um, which is a growing, growing section in the building industry, I'd be really concerned that if building does take off, There'll be a continuation of this. Just very quickly, the CIF was in here on Tuesday, and they said that 36% of the cost of a house is made up of tax to the state, right? But they based their figures on a very high inflated wage of a building worker. So they said that the average wage of a construction employee is 47,270. That's completely and utterly not true. Because building workers have had their wages, you know, reduced dramatically. The CSO said that the average was 38,000, but that would the majority of workers are on much, much less, and many of them far less. So the tax dividend from housing isn't as much as has been said. But under the Revenue Commissioners, which again <coughs> is the Department of Finance, there's been a massive increase in self-employment in the building industry. Um, I think a lot of it is bogus self-employment and forced self-employment, where contractors are forcing ordinary building workers to become self-employed. I've met building workers, I've talked to them about it, and that's what's happening. So in November last year, there was 99,741 subcontractors in the building industry. I mean, this is a joke. Of course there's not 99,000 subcontractors in the building industry. 30 23,000 are sole traders, they're individuals. And 76,000 are companies and partnerships. Now, why does this matter? The reason it matters is that the state is being deprived of vital tax revenues in the, in the construction sector, which would allow it, for example, to build social housing, to, to do all the other things that are needed. But the workers themselves are being denied of pension entitlements, of safety issues if they're self-employed. We all know the battle that workers have had to have wage to, to you know, pay proper stamps, to get proper recognition if they've an accident on site. So why do we now have a situation where 37% of all the people working in the building industry are self-employed? That's, that's incredible. And it just seems that the Department of Finance is not interested in doing anything about it. And I think the Construction Workers Alliance has estimated the state has lost two and a half billion in taxes since 2008 because of this, and obviously workers being endangered as well. So um, 
Minister, there are just some of the things I'd like you to answer. Thank you. Deputy, just, uh, Minister, I don't want to add a lot to it, but just to clarify one or two points. In your opening comments, you mentioned about the three billion of borrowing from the French government and uh, how it may be off balance sheet and whatever. And I suppose that's news for many of us at this committee. Would officials in your department be in a position to investigate that further and by means of correspondence keep the advice of the committee on that situation? That's the first thing. Uh, secondly, you made comment uh, earlier on in terms of the capital spend for 2016 that local authorities were, were unlikely to draw down all that was available. What's the underspend predicted at this stage? Um, because that, that's, at the, you know, we're talking about uh, the supply side and there's some concern and frustration from committee members that, you know, we need to try and front load things and it's a little bit disappointing to hear if the capital funding that's available for the current year isn't being drawn down fun fully. Um, that's adding to our problem in somewhat and we will have local authorities back again so that's important for us to know. And finally, Minister, uh, central bank rules around uh, uh, first uh, around lending and mortgages and so forth are fairly set and I know there will be reviews and whatever. But in terms of first time buyers, uh, do you have a view, and you're, you're always reluctant I suppose to interfere in the marketplace, but do you have a view in uh, saving schemes for first time buyers like the old SSIA but specifically uh, saving towards mortgages with state support? Um, do you think that would uh, be a useful in, in terms of a useful market intervention for those people or has it other negative effects on the market? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thanks very much, Chairman. Uh, out of respect for the Chair, and I'm sure Deputy Coppinger won't object, I'll answer your questions first. Yes, I'll ask the European Investment Bank, I'll ask my officials to get the details of the French scheme with the European Investment Bank. Uh, my former Private Secretary, John Morden, whom you'd have known, is still on the board of the European Investment Bank. And he's the source of my information, but he he didn't provide me with details yet. So, I mean, in general, the information is accurate, but we need to establish is there anything in the detail which was French specific, specific and would prevent us from accessing. But I'll ask officials to check. Uh, check Minister, that. thank you. Um, the underspend by local authorities, uh, you know, I often say that I only collect money. Uh, it was my colleague Brendan Howland in his department and public expenditure that spent it. And again, it's something that I've heard in the system. Uh, we can check that for you. If you would uh, please. The underspend, so we'll do that as well. And your uh, idea that uh, young couples should be assisted financially in putting together the deposits necessary for a loan, that's effectively your point. I'd like to see proposals on it. I certainly wouldn't roll it out uh, as a matter of principle, you know. I'd like to see if you can come up with some kind of working model uh, to do that. Uh, sorry, Deputy uh, Carpenter, for taking the, um, taking the chair first. But to come to your points, uh, initially you criticised me for ignoring housing and homelessness in my introductory remarks. And you said I didn't refer to it at all. Actually, the first sentence of what I said... No first sentence of what I said was firstly I want to thank the committee members for inviting me to discuss the important challenges that this country must address as regard housing and homelessness and the rest of my speech developed that point and on page two where you made the reference to the paragraph where I talked about uh, unless addressed it could pose a serious threat to competitiveness in the economy you picked that up as uh, I was only a cold-hearted economic uh, interventionist who had no interest in people and only in the economy. But the next sentence is, the housing shortage is also giving rise to major social issues, including rising homelessness driven by pressures on the rental market. So, uh, first of all, it's not true to say that I ignored the issues that you raised. I specifically addressed them, and uh, from the perspective of the Department of Finance then, I, I dealt with the issues. Sorry, uh, sir, I never said ignoring. I said you characterised it as a challenge and a shortage rather than an emergency and a crisis. That's all I said. Well, you know, I think when you were quoting the competitiveness uh, sentence, in fairness, you should have quoted the next sentence as well, where I talked about uh, the 
issue of homelessness and housing supply giving rise to major social issues, including rising homelessness. So, so uh, just in case anybody's listening to us and uh, they misunderstand what, what I'm saying. Now, you had a whole series of questions uh, after that. Uh, you talked about uh, it being unwise to stick to rigidly to the fiscal rules. Uh, because what we should do is borrow money at less than 1%, which is available now, and spend it effectively uh, to solve the housing ho homeless problem. But you see, the bit you're missing is that if we didn't stick to the fiscal rules, we wouldn't be getting money at less than 1%. Uh, when we came in in 2011, uh, the top rate of uh, lending for Ireland was about over 30%, uh, but very quickly it settled at around 10 and 11%. For 10 year money. Uh, so the actions of the government in adhering to a pretty rigid fiscal set of rules has brought that under 1%. And if you want to get more evidence, uh, look at the model that you have admired on a number of occasions in Dal Airn, uh, the model in Greece. Uh, they're at it trying to correct their situation for eight years and they're following a different model. Uh, they're paying. They're paying. They're paying. They're paying ten percent uh, for ten-year money. We're paying less than one percent for ten-year money. Uh, so it's not a question of having the, having choices to keep our interest rates at the rate they are now. We have to impose fiscal discipline on ourselves. But as we do it, the situation is improving, and we're getting more flexibility. And we'll use the flexibility uh, for the objectives that you talk about. You moved on then to criticise me for not intervening with what you describe as vulture funds. And these investment companies are colloquially known as vulture funds. Uh, it was a compliment in the first instance when they were so dubbed in America, because vultures uh, you know, carry out a very good service in the ecology. Uh, they clean up uh, dead animals that are littered across the landscape, uh, particularly in the prairie provinces. Uh, so it was a kind of a joke title for these. So we'll call them vulture funds. But the Consumer Protection uh, Regulation and Credit Service Firms Act, which I introduced, it, projects, it protects consumers whose loans are sold to previously unregulated entities, creating a consistent level of consumer protection for borrowers or yardless of the owners of their loans. Or to put it in very simple terms, if Bank of Ireland has a mortgage, uh, they have to comply with a code of conduct. And the rules under the code of conduct will have to be complied with by any purchaser of that mortgage as well, down to the last detail. So that there is no diminution of the rights of the mortgage holder when the loan is transferred. Also, tenants and landlords of rental properties which serve as security for loans sold by NAMA or any other agencies, they have the same rights and obligations as all other tenants and landlords in Ireland. So the purchaser of the loan book does not shed their responsibility uh, under the law, and the obligations are carried forward to the new owner. Vacant possession cannot be legally sought anywhere in Ireland by any landlord without meeting specific requirements as set out in the Residential Tenancies Act. And when the mortgage book is transferred to a new owner, uh, it doesn't clear them of the obligations under the Residential Tenancy Act. They have exactly the same obligations as the previous owner. And if such properties are vacated legally and subsequently sold, uh, well, it's the right of the property owner to sell on a property uh, in complying with law, if it's legally, if it's vacant, uh, why not? It increases supply on the market. Uh, otherwise, you, you'd let it there. Now, there are issues uh, around uh, vulture funds because we have uh, protocols uh, for dealing, in particular, with mortgage arrears, and they don't carry across. Uh, but in the next period of office. I intend in, 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 in uh, enshrining the principle of those in the Code of Conduct. Uh, so an extended Code of Conduct will apply to existing owners and new owners. Uh, but there, but there, there isn't an issue on it. As a matter of fact, there's an advantage, I would think, if a so-called vulture fund 
buy the loan book because uh, the vulture fund will buy the loan book at substantially less than the nominal value. So if the nominal value is 100 and they buy it at 80, they have more discretion to do deals than the original owner because they, they're still profitable if they do a deal with the 20%. So in terms of making arrangements uh, which would involve arrears write-offs, the vulture fund has a lot more flexibility than the original mortgage owner. So there are difficulties, and I'll address those difficulties. And if new difficulties emerge that they are pointed out to me, I'll address those. But they're not the difficulties that are recited uh, so frequently. Those difficulties are non-existent because uh, the new owner must comply with the law the same as the old owner, and we put that through legislation in the Dáil about two years ago. And, but as I say, there are advantages on one-to-one -one negotiations if people are looking for an arrangement because the vulture fund has more flexibility because the bot, uh, not at the nominal rate, but at a much cheaper rate. And of course they're in it to make profit. But who in the commercial world isn't in it to make profit? Uh, but the profit doesn't arise, uh, you know, from kind of selling houses out from under people. That's not the way they operate. Uh, what the, their main activity is taking a loan book where there are a lot of non-payers and underpayers and working their way up uh, to try and get all the loans serviced through a payment system. Uh, that's how they make their money. It's not by disposing of property. And at the end of the day, obviously, they're free to sell like every other property owner uh, is free to sell. Minister, the difference with a vulture fund is they buy a, a huge numbers of property at the one time and they do sell them en masse at the one time as is it being experienced right now by 40 families in one estate in Tyrrellstown. So vacant possession can be sought to sell a property in this country and that's the, what they cite. They you don't to, seem to have a, an have understanding of the, of the way that 40 families and then possibly 100 leaving an area at the one they, time is a problem. They, they have to comply with the law like any other owner of loan books in exactly the same way and all the protections apply uh, to the, the either the mortgage holders or the tenants under the new arrangement as applied under the old arrangement and that's the inhibition on them. The argument I'm making is that the transfer to new ownership does not disadvantage or give new rights to the vulture fund. They have the same rights and the same responsibilities as the previous owners. That's the point I'm making. And uh, on, the, on, on building, I agree with you that the model on, 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 on building sites is changing. Uh, the primary builder now is more correctly described as a developer. And uh, they, they, they work out the, the project through subcontractors by and large. Uh, so as a consequence of that, uh, a lot of uh, people who are skilled in the building industry are setting them up as, themselves up as subcontractors and they have their own small business. Now, that's just a change in the model and that's the way the world works and that's the way construction is working in all the major cities uh, around the world and Dublin is no exception. And if you look at the cranes on the skyline and you go to any of those sites, uh, which I haven't done, I'd be surprised if the work has not been carried out by quite a large number of subcontractors who come on site when their particular skill set is required to develop out the, the building. Now, there is a tax issue, but the revenue commissioners, uh, they have been working very hard uh, to modernise the relevant contracts tax, uh, the RCT procedures, to improve the system, to modernise it, and to counter tax avoidance and evasion. Uh, the uh, revenue have been rolling out ERTC, a new electronic RTC system. <coughs> the Department of si Finance and the Department of Social uh, Protection have also been examining whether people employed in sectors such as construction uh, should be regarded as either subcontractors or as employees. This is an issue that has been <coughs> raised by ICTU and is under active consideration. So there is no doubt that as the model changes, there is an issue and there's a revenue issue. The issue arises where <coughs> a, a guy who is working on a building site, who is not a subcontractor, 
but an employee decides, decides to describe himself in, with the collusion of his employer as a subcontractor. And then he's taxed as a subcontractor rather than an employee. And that's tax evasion. And that's a criminal offence. But the revenue are addressing it. And there was, it was pretty bad two years ago, even though activity was low. It's, it's cleaning up. And uh, we're giving revenue all the facilities they need and all the support they need. Uh, but you're right, there's a problem. But it's not a problem that, uh, you know, we're closing our eyes to, our revenue are closing their eyes to. And I assume, Chairman, you'll bring revenue in at some stage in these proceedings, and they can give you a more detailed account of this issue. But it was a very big problem. It's a lesser problem now. It's still a problem, but it's being addressed, is, is what I can say about that. Uh, I think I have, um, I think I have dealt with with everything. Okay, thank, thank Did you. Thank you, raise, Deputy. Yeah. Thank, well, uh, do you want to come if, if we're bringing revenue in, I think that that will be very important Harry. because uh, it's it's a problem that's easily dealt with by outlawing it. You know, that's, that's very easy to do, Minister. Well, it's outlawed already, you see. That's not the issue. The enforcement is it's outlawed because it's a criminal act to evade wor tax. Yeah. Wor workers but it's, and, it's, it's, yeah. it's making sure that they comply is the yeah. issue. Well, not, not the legally outlawed. Why would any bricklayer want to suddenly <coughs> become self-employed? You know, it's, it's, it's very obvious what has been going on, and I hope that it is going to be bring revenue in to talk about that. I, yeah, thank but, you. Uh, but the other, the other side of it is, if you have a bricklayer who is employing two more bricklayers, and he's contracting in uh, to do the brickwork or the block work on a building, he's probably a legitimate subcontractor. And he's entitled to uh, be taxed as a subcontractor. It's all the building bricklayers that are being forced into it, Minister. Well, Thank. if that's the case, then ECLU should bring that up with revenue and give them the information. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, I'd like to thank you and your officials for your attendance at this committee this morning and also to thank you in advance for the additional information which you've agreed to supply to the committee. Uh, we will now suspend till 2 o'clock. <laughs>